Hey everybody, Professor Long here, your AMP professor. Um, this video is intended for those students enrolled in my Biology 2402 or Human AMP2 course. Um, this is going to be the beginning of the series of heart lectures. Uh, we've already covered this material in class. This is during the COVID-19 or coronavirus outbreak. These videos are being done because I normally teach face-to-face, uh, -face, but because of the shutdown of the college and other things, um, we're not able to meet, so we're having a transition online. Um, please bear with me. I'm learning how to do this stuff. Also, I'm trying to include a little bit more of me in the video. Uh, a couple of students put some comments from my part one class saying they wanted to see more of me and not just my hands. I don't know why I got a face made for radio, but nonetheless, uh, here we go. This is heart lecture number one. And if you're following along in my class, we're on page 49 of the note set. Um, and if uh, and make sure you download uh, the worksheets that are going to be placed on Canvas so that you guys can answer a bunch of questions and prepare for the quizzes that are to come. If you're not in my class, hopefully you glean some uh, useful information from this. Maybe it'll make some things understandable. So now, um, before I get too far into the video, one of the things I want to review is um, ion movement and uh, cell, cell membrane permeability. Okay, <clears throat> So I'm going to do a quick review of that, and then we're going to go into the heart itself. So um, if you recall, our cells, the lipid bilayer, I'm only drawing a single line here, but it's a double layer of lipids, complex proteins, and other things mixed in. Um, what you're going to notice is that we have these integral membrane proteins that cross the membrane and form these channels. Um, these channels, because of the electrochemical properties of the proteins, are specific for certain ions and will let them flow across the cell membrane. Back in the 40s and 50s, some people did some experiments with ion concentrations and found out that the concentration of sodium ions is much higher outside the cell than it is inside. And therefore, sodium diffuses into the cell unchecked. It can bring with it some positive ion charge because it's a positively charged ion. This leads to, you know, the uh, setup of a resting membrane potential and allows us to generate action potentials in what are called excitable cells. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, if we look at it from outside to in, the concentration of sodium ions is much higher outside than in, and the laws of diffusion dictate it will enter the cell. Now, we also have some ion channels that are specific for the ion potassium. So let's say this blue one represents a potassium ion channel. Turns out the concentration for potassium is much higher inside the cell than it is outside. And potassium, by the laws of diffusion, would leak out of the cell causing the cell to lose some positive charge. We're not really worried about the charges so much right now as we are just the movement of ions. Now, because the concentration of potassium is so high inside the cell to outside, we can draw the concentration gradients like this. Okay, So we're going to see potassium, sodium flow into the cell, potassium flow out of the cell. If we let that happen unchecked, then the concentration of sodium would reach an equilibrium and the concentration of potassium and other ions as well would reach an equilibrium. If that were to happen, then we would be at um, we wouldn't be in homeostatic uh, situation. We wouldn't be in homeostatic conditions. Homeostasis requires this imbalance. You do not want to be at equilibrium. If you're at equilibrium, you're at room temperature. You're dead. So. In order to maintain this balance, and one of the differences between homeostasis and equilibrium is homeostasis requires the input of energy to maintain it, where homeostasis, um, equilibrium does not. So Mother Nature, in her grand design, added into our cell membranes a protein pump. And this protein has the ability to bind three intracellular sodium ions, two extracellular potassium ions, and it will break down a molecule of ATP, therefore using energy. And using the energy from this additional phosphate bond to flip, sort of. And what it does is it literally pumps the three sodiums back where they came. And it pumps the two potassiums back where they came, maintaining this imbalance. Most of your cells are capable of this and do this. <clears throat> Excitable cells have, in addition to all of this, um, gated channels. So let's say I have a gated sodium channel here that has a little gate on it. 
they actually have two gates, one on the inside, one on the outside. We're not going to get into the structure of the proteins. So now, if I have a set number of sodium channels and potassium channels and sodium potassium pumps, I can always maintain a resting membrane potential. If I open a gated channel and I let more sodium flow in, bringing positive charge, then the sodium potassium pump can keep up with. That's when we see on our action potentials that we leave the resting membrane potential. For neurons, it was minus 70 millivolts. And we start to drift slowly towards threshold potential, which was minus 60 millivolts. If I close the channel rapidly and reset everything, the sodium potassium pump can catch up to all of this and eventually we return to rest. This is the foundational principle for what we're going to talk about. Essentially, it's a review of action potentials, or at least the resting membrane potential of the cell. We've covered all this in part one in the nervous system, but it is the concept carries forward to part two AMP because this is how cardiac muscle cells work. Excitable cells, cells with gated channels that can conduct action potentials, include neurons and muscle cells, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle, as well as neurons. So now that we understand this principle, I'm going to go into um, the conduct conducting system of the heart and how the heart conducts its action potentials. Okay, so I'm going to erase all this junk, and we're going to talk about the heart. Now, this is going to be a generic picture of the heart. We have on top two atria and two ventricles at the bottom, right and left. You should know the anatomy of the heart by now. We've covered it very well in lab. We've already taken a lab test over it. Now, <clears throat> the heart has what we call a conducting system. There is an area of the heart up here that happens to be called the SA node. And the SA stands for sinoatrial node. The SA node just like the picture that I erased a second ago, has leaky sodium and potassium channels and sodium potassium pumps. It even has some gated channels. Now, the nodal cells, and there are two nodes in the heart. There's one near the bottom of the right atrium called the AV node or atrioventricular node. Both of these um, structures have cells that have an excessive number of leaky sodium channels. And because there's more leaky sodium channels than there are sodium potassium pumps, they don't sit at resting membrane potential very long. So if we were looking at the cardiocyte, and, you know, <clears throat> it depends on uh, where you look in the heart. It also depends on where you look in um, literature. The numbers can change a little bit, but for the most part, if we were looking at the heart, the numbers that our textbook uses is minus 90 millivolts is somewhat sort of the resting membrane potential, and minus 75 millivolts would be threshold. I drew that a little bit high compared to the scale that I have here, but let's say that's minus 75 millivolts. Somewhere up here, we're going to have zero, and we're going to have plus 30 millivolts. Now, we do not, this is not drawn to scale, but nonetheless, the concept stands. Because the SA node, if we were looking at cells in the SA node, because it has leaky sodium channels, as sodium ions leak in, faster than we can get rid of them, it will slowly drift towards threshold. Once it hits threshold, then it begins opening the first and the second, the third, and all of the voltage-gated sodium channels open, and it will depolarize. As it depolarizes, another unique feature of the heart is this. Cardiocyte cells have these membranes that are somewhat interlocked like this and are connected by these proteins, these little plates of proteins that are, make these specialized connections that allow ions to flow directly from one cell to another. So if I have a whole bunch of voltage flowing through here and this cell is depolarizing, and even though the sodium potassium pump is trying to kick some out, if I flood the cell faster with these ions than I can get them out, some of the ions, by the laws of diffusion, will flow into the next cell, bringing it to depolarize. And that would not only happen in this direction, in the heart cells, it happens in all directions. So once one cell depolarizes, the voltage is going to spread from this cell to this cell and this one and in every direction. These are the intercalated disks or gap junctions that we talk about between um, 
cardiocytes. So once the first cardiocyte cell depolarizes in the SA node, then the voltage starts to spread through all the others, and we can see the action potential literally spreading out from the SA node throughout the atria, and the atria begin to contract. At the same time, there's a line of cells that connect to the AV node called the internodal pathway, and the voltage is spreading through the internodal pathway at the same time. As the action potential spreads through the atria, they begin to contract and they top off the ventricles. Now, one of the things that um, I covered when I did blood flow through the heart and we'll talk about again is that about 70% of ventricular filling is going to occur due to gravity. So as the atria were just sitting and all four chambers are relaxed, the ventricles are slowly filling with blood and get approximately 70% full before the atria contract and top them off. Once topped off, when the atria contract, the ventricles are about 100% full. Now, what we don't want is we don't want the action potential to spread from the top of the ventricles towards the bottom or from the base towards the apex. We want the atria to contract from the base towards the apex, forcing the blood down through the two um, AV valves. But when the ventricles contract, we need them to squeeze blood up and out the two great vessels. The pulmonary trunk will come out the right ventricle going to the lungs. The aorta comes out the left ventricle, but they come out the top of the heart. If I were to squeeze from the top down, that would be the equivalent of me taking a bucket of water and splashing it off the floor, trying to get it through a hole in the roof. That's not efficient. So in order to prevent that action potential to spread from spreading all the way through the ventricles, Mother Nature, in our grand wisdom, designed in what we call the, um, uh, the skeleton of the heart. The skeleton of the heart is made of connective tissue, and it's dense connective tissue. And it gives the heart shape and support. And part of that skeletal structure of the heart, even though it's dense connective tissue, not bone, um, part of it extends out through the floors of the atria here. And remember from part one, dense connective tissue does not conduct um, does not conduct action potentials uh, or electricity very well, so that essentially stops the action potential from spreading. It's called the fibrous skeleton of the heart, and anytime you hear fibrous, you should start to think of collagen fibers or dense connective tissue. So now, I don't want the ventricles to not beat, so when the action potential stops at the fibrous skeleton of the heart, fortunately by now it has hit the AV node, it's going to run through what's called the bundle of his or the atrioventricular bundle that we learned in part 1 AMP. I mean, sorry, we learned in lab. And then it's going to spread through the two Purkinje fibers that lie in the interventricular septum all the way down here. I said Purkinje fibers to the bundle branches. And then it hits these Purkinje fibers. And that's where the first ventricular muscle cells um, begin being stimulated. And now the action potential will spread from these points all through the ventricles, squeezing from the apex towards the base. And that's going to squeeze this way. And it is this unique conducting system of the heart, from the SA node to the internodal pathway to the AV node to the bundle of his, to the two bundle branches to the Purkinje fibers, that causes the heart to contract in a unique fashion. It contracts from the base towards the apex and the atria, topping off the ventricles. As the atria relax, the ventricles contract, squeezing blood out the two great vessels out the top of the heart. The ventricles relax, the AV valves open, and it begins filling, and then all four chambers stay relaxed. So instead of being boom, 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 it's boom, 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 boom. It's a unique rhythm. It goes one, atria contract, two, Atria relax while the ventricles contract. Three, ventricles relax. Four, all four chambers stay relaxed. Boom, 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 boom. And that unique contraction occurs because of this conducting system of the heart. So you should know the order of structures contracting. I'm not going to write them out here. You should look them up in your textbooks, look them up in your notes, but I will say them. First, the SA node depolarizes. As the action potential spreads through the atria, it spreads through the internodal pathway to the AV node. 
once the AV node is um, stimulated to to, contra to fire an action potential, it sends it through the internodal path. I'm sorry, through the bundle of his, or also called the atrial ventricular bundle, through the two bundle branches, and then the Purkinje fibers, and then it stimulates the ventricles to contract. So you should know that order of things. You should be familiar with the gap junctions or um, intercalated discs, allowing the action potential to spread through the muscle cells. You should know that the nodal cells, you know, automatically depolarize. The heart is said to be autorhythmic, meaning it sets its own pace. One of the unique things about the, the heart is this. If I have a skeletal muscle cell here, I actually have to have a neuron release acetylcholine on at the neuromuscular junction to get the cell to contract. And every time I do, the cell will open some chemically gated sodium channels, reach threshold, and fire an action potential and contract. If I cut the neuron, then every time I send the signal, the signal stops. The muscle cell becomes essentially paralyzed through flaccid paralysis. It cannot open any chemically gated channels, and it's not going to reach threshold. We don't want that with the heart, so the heart is autorhythmic. What that means is because the nodal cells automatically leak some sodium in without any neural stimulation, they will depolarize the threshold. Of course, once we open the voltage-gated channels, it will go all the way through the action potential. It's the all or none principle. We'll cover the cardiocyte action potential in the next video. Um, but nonetheless, it gives you a good idea of the conducting system of the heart and how it works. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you learned something from it. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I hope everyone else is surviving this whole coronavirus COVID-19 thing uh, very well and that life gets back to normal pretty soon. Anyway. Um, study, be ready for a quiz, review this material, know it, try to draw it, try to teach it to someone else so that you understand it. In the next couple of videos, we're going to go over the rest of how the heart works. So um, have some fun with it, folks.